So I'd like to talk about the idea of progress. Progress is the cornerstone of modernity, the underlying myth by which all things are, are to be interpreted. To be progressive is to support the betterment of, of humanity. It is the hope that we can overcome our long-held prejudices such as racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and other forms of discrimination and embrace our shared humanity. Who could be against that? But progress also has another meaning. It is not only a view of, uh, of where we must go from here, but a view of history as leading inexorably towards the society we live in today. It views modernity as providential, uh, as a triumph of reason over superstition, of humanity uh, throwing off the shackles of its past and realizing its destiny. This understanding has its roots in the Abrahamic religion, which sees all of time as caught between the fall and the eschaton. Where the ancients had a more cyclical view of time, uh, this view sees time as trajectory, as a story of, of a divine struggle over the fate of creation, uh, with good ultimately a destined to triumph over evil. Missionaries saw it as their duty to convert the heathen to win over souls to God as part of the struggle. Yet the fall was also part of this narrative, and people were just likely to emphasize our, our descent from paradise. Indeed, the eschaton of scripture comes about not as a result of the world getting better, but precisely at our darkest moment, when all seems lost. The idea of a lost golden age held much more currency throughout most of the West's history. It was in the Renaissance that the term Dark Ages came, was coined to describe a period from which they had recently emerged. This age was dark uh, because classical texts had stopped being translated into Latin, and thus were lost to the West for generations, only to be recovered during the Crusades. Our understanding of the medieval era remains colored by this bias to this day, obscuring many significant developments during this time, including the near elimination of the Roman system of slavery that dominated for centuries. The figures of the Renaissance saw progress only as society's recovery from, from the long cloud of this age uh, back to the glory of the classical world. The myth of the backward medieval period has led to the false belief that people back then didn't bathe or that they routinely burned witches, both phenomena that uh, properly belonged to the Renaissance itself. The medieval era saw the creation of craft guilds in the first universities, which were themselves a kind of guild. These egalitarian communities were formed by artisans and tradesmen coming together to support the craft. They created magnificent works of architecture that were later dubbed Gothic by their uh, Renaissance detractors. They collectively ran their own free cities, known as communes, in which their members held equal status to that of any noble. These communes banded together uh, to form their own confederations, including the Hanseatic League in the north and the Lombard League in the south, both of whom resisted the might of the Holy Roman Empire. The Renaissance, of course, saw its own developments. The scientific revolution, begun by Copernicus in his heliocentric model of the universe, radically shifted our understanding of the cosmos, to the point that Kant later dubbed his own philosophical paradigm shift a Copernican revolution. Galileo's conflict with the church has been mythologized by modernity as paradigmatic of science's battle with religion and superstition. Yet what Galileo challenged was not scripture, but the science of his day, and his detractors included not only church officials, officials but numerous scientists who operated within an Aristotelian paradigm, which itself only became popular as a result of the scholastic recovery of classical, of classical texts. In fact, the much maligned scholastics had ushered in a new era of empiricism without, without which the science of the Renaissance would not have been possible. The medieval era saw, saw advances in mechanics, metallurgy, hydraulics, navigation, and optics. The scientific revolution was certainly a radical paradigm shift, but it was not in any sense the beginning of science itself. At the same time, the Renaissance saw advancements in art, science, and philosophy. Uh, it, it also became embroiled in superstition and panic. The Malleus Maleficarum, the witch's hammer, spends considerable effort arguing against the church's long-held position that belief in witchcraft was illusory and superstitious. The Protestant Reformation saw Europe divided against itself, with each side obsessed with hunting down heresy. It was in this context that we find so much of the torture, witch burnings, and, and religious intolerance that is so often laid at the feet of the medieval world. This was happening not prior to the scientific and, and humanistic achievements of the Renaissance, but simultaneously. It is also interesting that at the same time commoners were being hunted down as witches, an interest in astrology, alchemy, and the occult was flourishing among the nobility. This was when Nostradamus was prophesying to Catherine of Medici, and John Dee was using his scrying mirror to channel uh, the language of the angels. The occult was in fact deeply tied to the science at the time, and the division between the two is anachronistic. Both were attempts to pierce the veil of the empirical world and discern the, uh, the secret forces behind it. This culminated in the work of Sir Isaac Newton, 
whose work estab establishing the foundations of modern science stands alongside the explorations of alchemy, biblical prophecy, and Rosicrucianism. This era also saw the Great Age of Exploration. After the Ottomans cut off uh, European access to the Silk Road, another trade mount route to the east was sought, leading Christopher Columbus to set out for Asia, only to discover a new continent they called the New World. Here, Europeans encountered many people they considered savages, half-naked, living off the land, illiterate, and never having heard the gospel. Such peoples were seen by Columbus and many who came after him as right for enslavement. Yet they also found advanced civilizations, such as the Aztecs and, and Inca. Fernando de Soto uh, sailed up the Mississippi and uh, documented an advanced culture that, later, that came to be known as, the, as Mississippian, or the Mound Builders. Later Europeans would claim that the mounds they left behind were unrelated to the, to the native peoples they encountered, despite cultures such as the Cherokee maintaining an oral tradition of their mound-building past. European missionaries extensively documented uh, their conversations with indigenous peoples. The Jesuit chronicles of such contacts with the Huron were widely read throughout Europe. What's intriguing about them is that the critiques, uh, is the critiques of European society leveled by the natives. They criticized the authoritarianism of European society, in which society was organized by a strict chain of command. David Graeber and David Wingro suggest that their, uh, their ideas on freedom and equality may have influenced the Enlightenment in Europe. The idea that people might live without kings, without a ruling class, deeply appealed to many European intellectuals, who wondered if they too might be able to reorder society in, uh, in this manner. A modern idea of progress developed as a reaction against this sentiment. Long ago, th the story goes, all people lived like savages, close to the land in, in small bands of hunter-gatherers, but then society became larger and more complex, and a state was necessary to manage this complexity. To seek the kind of egalitarianism found among these primitives would be to turn back the clock and forsake all the technological, scientific, and cultural advancement that makes our civilization great. This notion of progress became entangled with colonialism. In addition to bringing Christianity, Europeans sought to civilize the peoples they encountered. Many, uh, by making them wear European clothes and adopting European economic and political practices, they're raising, they're raising up the savages and teaching them civilization. The plunder of their land and resources was justified because they did not know how to use it. Even slavery was seen as a civilizing force, beating the savage out of them and teaching them the value of hard work. European rule in the Americas, in Africa, and in Asia were, uh, were all part of some great white man's burden to bring civilization to the rest of the world. This notion of progress was further entrenched by the Industrial Revolution, in which the forces of production were radically overhauled. The craft guilds of the medieval era gave way to the factory and the assembly line, uh, in which work was done by a series of repetitive tasks in which, worker, in which workers could be readily trained and easily replaced. The wood mills and water mills of past eras gave way to steam power, fueled by coal dug up by, from, the, from the ground. Steel allowed the construction of great wonders, while trains and steamboats allowed people to travel in uh, in days, distances that once would have taken months. The age of the machine was awe-inspiring and a sure sign of the greatness of European civilization. Few people were, were more impressed with this age than its most salient critic. In the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx heaps great praise upon the bourgeoisie and the revolution they had ushered in by mobilizing these productive forces. The bourgeois economists themselves could hardly bring themselves to marvel at the great wonders of this age as Marx did, but precisely because to speak of its wonders was to approach its poisonous underbelly. This age of mechanical marvels was built by the vast exploitation of labor. The factories in England, the plantations in America, uh, the railroads that spanned the continents, all made possible by dispossession and plunder. The machine uh, produced nothing by itself. It was a lever by which the bourgeoisie was able to extract more labor out of the workers. Marx drew up a developmental path similar to that of his Victorian contemporaries. Uh, with society starting with primitive communism, then advancing through Asiatic and, and feudal modes of production before rising, arriving at capitalism. However, he saw this progress developing further into socialism and finally a new communist age made possible by the development of the forces of production. It was therefore incumbent upon socialists in order to bring about uh, a global socialist revolution to mobilize the forces of production throughout the world. This had the paradoxical effect of socialists Bring, uh, bringing state capitalism to, agra to agrarian societies in order to build socialism. Marx himself came to distance himself from this stage theory of development in his later years, but it would have a huge impact on, on the Marxism of the 20th century. The conquest of Tibet, the, uh, the collectivization of agriculture in Ukraine, some of the worst atrocities uh, associated with communism, all were undertaken under the notion of being historically progressive. 
Meanwhile, the Victorian world was enthralled with uh, the scientific discoveries of Charles Darwin. His teaching of evolution, his theory of evolution, uh, not only posited a common descent of all life, but explained it in terms of a struggle for survival. This was readily applied to the social world, in which social progress was described by figures such as Herbert Spencer as survival of the fittest. Since capitalist hierarchy was competitive and not based on feudal hereditary titles, the market was seen as a kind of sorting mechanism in which the most worthy rose to the top. This is applied to racial hierarchy, and scientists set about for proof of the biological superiority of the white race. Furthermore, an idea emerged that this genetic fitness uh, could be uh, further improved upon deliberately through selective breeding uh, as well as sterilizing those deemed to have inferior genes. This idea, known as eugenics, was popular among both left and right until the horrors of the Holocaust sought to its terrifying conclusion. The two world wars shook the world from this deep-seated faith in progress. The long peace of the 19th century was ended by the brutality of the First World War, while faith in the Enlightenment and the triumph of reason was shattered by, uh, as Germany, renowned center of intellectual life and social progress in the previous century, descended into tyranny and used state-of-the-art technology to commit the greatest mass murder the world had ever seen. Many began to question the very notion of progress. The West had conquered the world based on some concept of, his own, of its own world historical destiny. Another disillusionment happened following the failed May of 68 uprising in, in France, in which many leftists found themselves betrayed by the Communist Party, who worked with the de Gaulle government to stop it. Many of the veterans of this movement, including Lyotard, Foucault, and Baudrillard, uh, responded to this betrayal uh, by abandoning not only Mar Marxism, but history itself. A new era of post-modernity began to, uh, to question all meta-narratives. Any totalizing understanding of history, whether liberal, Marxist, Christian, or so on, became suspect. Critics such as Jürgen Habermas have noted that, uh, that the suspicion of meta-narratives is itself a meta-narrative. While unflinching faith in progress has led to atrocities, the refusal of, uh, of meta-narrative has a way of leading to paralysis. If there is no greater truth, then one has no basis for judging anyone else's truth, including the modernist meta-narrative of progress itself that, that this view is meant to challenge. Now, one can take a pluralist view of truth without falling into such total relativism, but even then, such, plural, such plural, plurality of truths uh, have to ha have uh, some quality in common of being true. They would, essentially, be variations of a single truth. Along with postmodernists, there are anti-modernists, who, uh, who instead of progress see only degeneracy. Fundamentalism emerged as one such response to modernity, treating scripture and dogma not only as spiritual truth, but scientific truth as well. It offers a fully rationalized faith, in which tradition is an infallible source of all answers. There are likewise traditionalists who, who call for return to the old ways of throne and altar, such reactionary sentiments invariably involve revisions of the past in order to embrace bigotry under the guise of aesthetics. Then there are those who seek to go beyond postmodernism. Ken Wilber's integral theory attempted to map the evolution of consciousness through different color-coded stages, in which postmodern green consciousness was beyond modern orange consciousness, which was in turn beyond pre-modern mythic blue and magic red consciousness. Beyond green, he claimed there was an emerging integral consciousness of teal and turquoise levels. His system flatters the ego of his followers, for he assures them that if this work uh, speaks to them, then they are among this cognitive elite of, of integral thinkers. Yet such a schema is simply modernism under new guise. The same modernist understanding of cultural evolution that treated primitives as less evolved than the civilized West simply gets a new gloss under mystical platitudes about consciousness. A new trend calls itself metamodernism. Cultural theorist uh, Timotheus Vermeulen summarizes this ethos thusly. Grand narratives are as necessary as they are problematic. Hope, hope is not simply something to distrust. Love not necessarily something to be ridiculed. Metamodernism vacillates between modernism and postmodernism, making use of both irony and sincerity. It essentially relativizes meta-narrative meta without attempting to discard it. For my part, however, I side with Michael Hart and Antonio Negri in calling for an ultra-modernity. The problem is not meta-narrative as such, but only an overly monistic and flattening meta-narrative that makes no room for pluralism and diversity. We must discard the modern myth of progress, but this does not mean abandoning progress as such. We can reject uh, the colonial mentality that conquered the globe while seeking a new cosmopolitan spirit that honors the uniqueness of different cultures and perspectives. Truth is manifold, not as many discrete truths, but as one truth unfolding in a myriad of forms. What really needs to be re-examined is how we conceive of progress. 
A band of hunter-gatherers or a small Urian village uh, may offer some insight into our own past, but they are not frozen at some lower stage of development com compared to contemporaneous industrial nation-states. We must resist the, tem the tendency to define progress with re respect to our own culture. Such society is not deficient in some quality their own society has, but make uh, their own uh, decision to develop in a way that they choose. Our modern notion of progress has been one of conquest, expansion, and control. It has been based on class stratification and plunder of the commons. It is a mechanistic notion of progress based on an endless drive for accumulation. It is a quantitative progress, progress as more. I suggest that we should reimagine progress as inclusion, as pursuing our own betterment while making space for others with their own unique telos. It is expressed in the Zapatista slogan, a world where many worlds fit. Such a world does not have room for an extractive drive for infinite growth, but it does have room for a plurality of cultures, of philosophies and spiritualities, of ways of understanding. This is the meta, a meta narrative of liberation, of the commons to which we all belong. This is the ethic, uh, this is the telos towards which uh, we, should we should orient our gaze, the true progress toward which we must strive.